Uh, so I want to make sure we thank the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, which provided uh, some of the funding to help offset uh, the work. It turned out this was a really big project. Um, and so uh, in addition to uh, the day hours, uh, which Bill knows about, uh, my collaborators, uh, Melissa Hanneman, Amber Lee, and I uh, also spent a lot of our own time because this was, this was uh, 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 a lot of work. Um, We've had a series of grants for open source analysis, um, and we had uh, initially a State Department grant that provided for kind of a survey of the literature, but what we really wanted to do and what we're really grateful for DITRA for helping us do is we wanted to see if we could take uh, the things we found in the literature in terms of things you can do and apply those to nonproliferation cases in order to make tools and approaches and practices uh, that can actually help answer non-proliferation questions. And the one we picked, um, which in retrospect was dumb because it was really, really hard and we spent a lot of time wondering if we were actually going to find anything, uh, was this question of uh, where North Korea builds uh, its missile launchers. Uh, or as Stephen Schwartz calls it, with apologies to Ashton Kutcher, uh, dude, where's my towel? <laughs> 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 uh, the Tell in question is a transporter erector launcher, uh, and the one we were most interested in is this one, which the North Koreans have now paraded uh, through Pyongyang twice. Uh, it carries something called the KN-08 Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, uh, but the truck itself is really quite interesting. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a transporter because, you know, it transports it. Uh, an erector because it's got this thing on the back that erects it, and launcher because that's what you do with missiles. But what was really interesting when the North Koreans paraded this uh, was it bore a shocking resemblance to this particular truck, uh, a chassis and a cab manufactured by a Chinese company that makes the transporter erector launchers uh, for the People's Liberation Army 2nd Artillery. Uh, and you can see that here. Uh, almost immediately after this thing paraded through Pyongyang, uh, bloggers and other folks managed to find the brochure I showed you, put them together, and you can see it's the same truck. I mean, really, down to little details relating to sort of the grill work and the placement of the doors and the shape of the windows. You can see there's a notch here, which is filled in, but, you know, normally it's open to provide a spot for the missile. This was a really interesting problem because it's almost certainly uh, a violation of China's own export control regulations. It's a violation of the missile technology control regime, which is you know, a voluntary guideline, um, and it's a violation of United Nations sanctions. You cannot export trucks like this to North Korea, but the Chinese did, and they had a, an interesting explanation, and we worked... Uh, we worked with our Chinese colleagues to sort of figure out what that explanation was, uh, and we had some conversations with folks on the UN panel of experts, and if you read the final panel of experts report, uh, the Chinese version of the story is the North Koreans bought the chassis and the cabs, uh, and they bought them uh, stating an end use of forestry. <laughs> yes, you could carry logs, it sort of resembles a log. Um, <laughs> But that the North Koreans added the erector launcher, right? This piece here that handles the missile. And the panel of experts wanted to know, is that true? Right? Um, and so we kind of got interested in this question of, uh, could they have done it themselves? If so, where would they have done it? Um, and uh, we started poking around. And something very interesting happened, which is where kind of new media comes in. Um, Everything I tell you that we did, you could have done 50 years ago. But it would have been really, really hard. Right? The thing about the information revolution that's amazing is how cheap and easy it is to exchange information. Right? And a perfect example is the North Koreans have made propaganda films for a very long time. Um, but the act of getting access to them used to be really hard, and now it's not, because they put them all on YouTube. Uh, and they put them all on YouTube because there are uh, sympathetic groups to the DPRK. And propaganda films play an important role, right? They're propaganda. It's important for the DPRK that they are sympathizers 
see their films. <laughs> and so we now have this amazing ability uh, to go through their propaganda. And as it turns out, there are plenty of people, bloggers and others, who do this. Right? And uh, a colleague of mine at a place called uh, North Korea Leadership Watch found something really quite interesting, uh, which is this uh, very short little video of of Kim Jong-il in a very interesting spot. That's a transporter erector launcher in a building. Right. And that's a KN-08 transporter erector launcher in a very similar looking building. And that's another yeah. Something else, very interesting. But <laughs> that's all. That tiny little clip is the only video we've ever seen from either the inside or the outside of the place where it seems like the North Koreans do the final assembly of their transporter erector launchers. And we kind of got to thinking, could we find that place? Because I don't know if you noticed in that tiny little clip, and I'll walk through you, it's a very weird shaped building. First of all, it's three or four clips, okay? It happens, cuts very fast, it feels like it's maybe from one visit, it's not. The first clip shows uh, what's a nodong, a transporter erector launcher. And you can see this is not like this room or any building you're going to be in. Right? There's a row of very high windows, but no, no, no windows along the wall. Brian tells me those are called clear story windows. I didn't know. I learned all these interesting architectural terms. Um, and it seems that there are no windows on this side of the building, so it's either partially buried or it has structures next to it. It's got a peaked roof. Right? It's very long. Um, so this is one clip. Now the second clip, which may actually be two or three, shows Kim next to a note on tell. We actually think it's a different tell. Yeah, I'll spare you why, but staring at like the placement of windshield wipers and things. Um, but here you see the roof. This is the roof. It extends, and there's like a cupola, right? And so that's a weird building, right? This is a big, long warehouse with a cupola in the middle. Oh, that's interesting. Then we started looking at this, and this was the third clip, can away, it's right? It pans from here to here. This is the other side of that building, right? No windows. Very interesting window pattern along the back edge. You know? And look, that is a different cupola. The one, the first cupola is like a square in the middle of the building. This one runs all the way across. Those are two weird looking buildings, right? So um, Melissa and I started playing around with this. Could you model the outside of the building from the inside? I mean, it's weird looking. Um, I'll give you the cleaned up versions, um, but the first ones we did by hand were pretty horrible, so I'll, I'll spare you those. But eventually, Melissa builds a computer model of the building slash buildings uh, based on the film, right? And so here are stills from the computer model replicating um, the inside of the building. And so, you know, she's able to count girders. You know, you see the interesting light placement, the unusual window pattern. It becomes clear that um, in one shot, the windows are irregular, right? They're not evenly spaced. That's a pattern, that'll be useful. Here, in this one, right, they don't match, right? So it's got a different roof and has a slightly different window pattern. So initially we think it's maybe two buildings. Then it turns out no, it's not, then it turns out it is, then it turns out it's not, it goes back and forth, so that's part of the story. But we're able to get a really pretty nice uh, computer model. And so here I'll just show you sort of a brief second of what we're able to model of this building. Um, right, so we're able to put the tells inside and sort of model. Now what's it look like from the outside? Yeah, this is fun. So we come up with kind of two models. And like I say, these are all cleaned up after the fact. The original ones are really horrible sketches with my scribbles all over them. But one with a cupola that runs all the way across right, and one with a short little cupola. And you know, no windows on one side and high clear story windows on the other side. I actually had to convince an editor that was a word. I... <laughs> <laughs>
that's a weird looking building, right? If I can get a satellite photograph of that thing, that we're gonna we're gonna recognize that. The question is, where do you start looking? Well, there are other open source things that are pretty useful. This is a memoir in Japanese by a Korean guy who uh, claims to have worked at a factory where they made missile launchers. Right. And so there's a ton of information in Korea uh, by defectors that give the locations of various factories. Uh, and uh, one of our graduate students, Amber Lee, is a very good, uh, very good researcher, native Korean speaker. Uh, and so she translates a bunch of these things. Um, things like this often are very detailed. I mean, this book is incredibly boring, but he gives, like, he spends all this time on geography, you know, like, oh, well, there's a factory here, and the name of the district is there, and then you cross a bridge, and you go three kilometers, and then there's another factory, which, you know, it's horrible to read, but for us is gold. And as it turns out, there are a lot of defector references to where they do the final assembly of their missile launchers, uh, sort of all over the country, but they, cluster in this place uh, called, uh, well, near Kangi. Now what's great about that is it's a center of forestry. <laughs> um, and who knew they had a sense of humor? <laughs> but in particular, references cluster around two places, uh, Chungsonggang and Hakmu. All right, I'm sorry, I don't speak Korean. My language is terrible. And interestingly, these two places are close to one another. Right? So if you were to plot all of the references in the literature on a map, right, and this is a sort of data mining exercise, you get a nice cluster here. Um, Jeonchan, Chunsonggan, and Songgan are the places that are listed often, and they appear in um, uh, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency has a gazetteer of place names. Hakmu does not appear, um, but it's described in one defector account as being six kilometers northwest of John John, and it turns out there's a World Health Organization report that confirms such a place does exist. So we sort of guesstimated where it was. So we figured we'd start here, right? That's a pretty good place to start. Uh, this, by the way, is the heart of North Korea's defense industry. So several defector mentions, a cluster, and uh, the heart of the defense industry, to say nothing of the amusing forestry coincidence. We figured we'd start here, and we'd start looking at you know, these little river valleys. Um, well, we thought we could make our lives a little bit easier through one additional step, uh, which is a nice crowdsourcing technique. There are people who spend their lives, I have no idea why they do this, but they spot um, North Korean surface-to-air missile sites. Right? And so North Korea Uncovered has a wonderful list of them. And it struck us that if you know a facility is important enough for Kim Jong-il to make a visit and put in a propaganda film, it's probably defended. Right? The fact that they defend it sort of also helps reveal location. Uh, so we happen to load uh, the location of um, all the surface air missile sites in the area. And the, these are the red dots. Suddenly, Hakmu looks really interesting, right? It's a place that we know exists, that they don't talk about very much, that's in the heart of the defense industry, and it's really well defended by surface to air missile sites. Oh, we thought, no, we just take a, take a closer look. Um, and, you know, here are little houses running all up in here, and that's about six kilometers northwest, sort of, if you, you know, go from the train station, which I use as a rough approximation of downtown. Uh, and you really start looking, and, and I'll blow it up a little more, and you see right there is a surface-to-air missile site, which you can see here, sort of unique pattern, right, on a hillside. And right down on the hillside, this is a very funny looking building. Look at that sucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've seen you before. <laughs> so it turns out it does, it's not a square that runs all the way across, it's a fan. But it has the unique three pattern, and oh hey, that's why the windows are up high. There are structures on either side. Right. Huh. I wonder where the other building is. Well, we went and looked at the historical imagery. This is the building today. This is the building in 2004. Little cupola. So here it is with the can awaits, the fan thing running all the way across. And here it is with a hill gong and the little cupola on top. You know why? 
they replaced the roof when they bought the chassis from the Chinese because that's where they installed the erector. You can see other changes at the site too. They paved this. This used to be dirt, but you know, can of it's big. Okay. They paved it. Just generally improved the condition of the site. Unique window pattern. There it is right there. One, two, three, four, five. Three little ones. Two big ones. Yep, that's your site. Then we got, um, we, thanks to 38 North, we bought a new satellite image. Got a, uh, it's called low liquidity. Uh, you can see the irregular window pattern, right? It's really hard to see, but they're the little dark splotches. The windows aren't evenly spaced. Neither are those windows evenly spaced. That's your building. Went back to the brochure, had a question. Can you fit a can of weight in that? I mean, it looks like they redid the building so it can fit. So you can probably guess what the answer is going to be. Um, we went back, we got the technical specifications on the truck. And uh, Tamara Patton, who works in our Vienna office, and a colleague named Frank Pavian, helped to take still photographs and the specifications and extract dimensions and make a three-dimensional model of the truck. So we'll put it in. And not surprisingly, that's the truck with the missile erected. It fits perfectly. And of course it does, because that's why they built the roof, right? Of course it fits perfectly. It's designed for this purpose and this purpose only. That roof exists so that they could add the erector launcher to their chassis and cabs they imported from China. Now you may be thinking, like, ooh, that's a really tight fit, right? How do they move that around? We were baffled by this. Um, but again, so, right, new media. We've managed to use uh, social media to find the video. We've managed to... Um, use all kinds of uh, data mining techniques, including crowdsourcing, in order to narrow our search area. We've been able to model uh, the facility using uh, sort of visualization tools. And then Melissa goes on Facebook and asks, uh, you know, her network of friends, which turns out includes a cousin who's a long distance trucker. <laughs> you know, can you really parallel pack the, you know, park the thing in such a tight space? And he basically says, you know, no, silly. You don't parallel park. Uh, you use casters. Right? Tight space. They're selling you casters. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you want to buy some casters, I can put you in touch. But, you know, since they're not endorsing us, uh, I'm not going to So, right, the places we were looking, here's Hack Moon, there's Site A, we call it Site A. That's where it is. Then we noticed something really interesting at Site B, because we're still worried about the windows. Right? The windows for the Nodong don't match perfectly. And it may be that they change the windows when they change the roof. But we keep looking, and then we find something else. Pretty interesting. <clears throat> That's not the building I just showed you earlier. That's a duplicate of the building a couple of kilometers away. It went through exactly the same change. Um, so we're currently mulling over the possibility that the Nodong shot's from in here, and the KN08 shot is from the other one. We just need to get more satellite images. But the fact is, they're very close to one another. They are part of the same site. And this is where North Korea assembles its transporter erector launchers. Um, <laughs> I couldn't resist. I had to do it twice. <laughs> So, I mean, what we took away from this, uh, and I've already talked long enough, is that, again, you could have done any one of these things 50 years ago, right? Um, although commercial satellite image is a little harder to come by. Um, but fundamentally, the principles have always been possible, right? Each, of, each one of these tools existed, but they were incredibly hard to use. It was hard to get a North Korean propaganda film. It was hard to get uh, defector books. It's hard to find somebody who speaks Korean and can do a translation. It was 
hard to draw the building on the outside based on the inside. And I know, because I tried doing it by hand. It didn't work. It was really only when Melissa started to play with it um, uh, that it worked out. It was hard to get answers to questions like, how exactly do you move a truck around in a confined space? It was hard to try to take a drawing or a picture of a missile, make a drawing, and then see if you could fit in the building, right? You could do all of it, but it was really tough. And as a consequence, because each step was really hard, you almost never could do an integrated analysis, right? And I'll give you a practical example of that. We've been working on um, historical U.S. intelligence estimates of places like uh, Lanzhou, which is where China initially produced... Uh, highly enriched uranium for its nuclear weapons. The US intelligence community mismeasured the building. They didn't mismeasure it because they're terrible. They're really good. They're probably a lot better than we are. Um, but it was harder then, right? It just was harder. There weren't as many pictures. The pictures weren't as good. There were fewer ways to double check your work. Um, just, it was tougher. Uh, so what I like to say, and it's it, it, sort of my concluding thought is, it is now so much cheaper Right, to spread information around. That it's easier to get the information, it's easier to analyze it, it's easier to collaborate with other people and share it, that it results in something that's not just more, but it's qualitatively different. Right? So in our field, what we used to do uh, is, well, we used to tell, different sense of the word, with two L's. Right? We could describe a facility, we could tell you where it was, we could tell you what it's like, um, but now we can show. Right? And that's a more data-intensive process that enables you to do a lot more interesting things. Uh, and I happen to think this is probably one of the most fun things I've ever done. Uh, and even if it's in theory possible to do 10 years ago, I know I wouldn't have been doing it. Thank you for that fantastic talk, Jeffrey. And uh, we have time, actually quite a bit of time, to receive questions. And uh, I'll let Jeffrey call, because he's uh, also, among the other things he does, he also instructs here at the NIS as uh, one of our professors. Yeah, but they don't raise their hands. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, questions? We'll start. Actually, uh, if I could. Sure. Um, I, I would like to throw out a question to one of the students in here who may have taken the 3D modeling workshop that Ms. teaches, and maybe ask them to explain how we knew how tall the building was, how, how big it was. So if there's any brave souls who took the 3D modeling workshop. Oh, yeah, I admitted that. I should Who would like to answer that? <laughs> so, all of you remember your geometry, probably, right? So the idea is, is that you have a building, and you have that building's shadow. You can figure out what time of day it is, what the date is, based on when the satellite image was taken. So you, put the, you start with the building, you adjust the height until it matches its own shadow, so then you can find out. So it's not the most accurate method in the world, but you're going to get within a meter or so easily. So when we say the KN08 fits, that's because we measured the height of the of the cupola from the shadows. Yeah, and I have to say, I mean, Melissa did great work here because as you can see this roof, well, maybe it's hard to see. It's not it's not flat. Right? It's not um, well, it's not flat, which means there's an additional angular issue going on. But uh, there was this great moment where you know, we're looking at this fan structure and Melissa's trying to model how tall it is. Uh, and it's casting a really long shadow, right? And she's sort of cranking it up, and she's like, I don't know, this is a really, really tall structure, right? And so for the longest time, we thought maybe it's not right. But then when you put the can away tell it, you realize, no, actually, that's that's exactly how tall it is. So uh, I would add, the, then the additional bonus is you get, you have the shadow measurement and then you have the KN08, and they are both perfect matches. Um, you know, you get a sense that you're pretty close. Bill. Yeah, a couple of different uh, questions here. Uh, I'm kind of curious the extent to which you receive some feedback or have a sense of, you know, how our own uh, uh, Intel community uh, responds to you know the work that we're doing. Um, Secondly, um, to what extent does uh, our revealing kind of the success mm -hmm. of our method uh, encourage uh, <laughs> steps by 
uh, perspective, kind of cheaters yeah. or whatever you want to say, to, to make it more difficult for Melissa and you and, and Tamara yeah. uh, to do their work. And then my third question, uh, are there any other kind of puzzles that you're pursuing at the moment uh, that I should know about? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I have a lot of friends in the intelligence community. I get very polite but circumspect notes. I think they think we did a good job, but obviously they couldn't sort of. But I, um, you know, we've done a series of things like this now, and I don't think I've ever gotten the you guys suck, you should pack it in note, you know. I get the, wow, that's very interesting, you know. Some people will be having a fun day tomorrow, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we're doing pretty well, and I'll make a suggestion along that lines for the third question, which is, are there other things you should know about? Yeah, there are a few. Um, <laughs> You know, my, one of the things that we definitely encounter is, um, I don't know if it's necessarily deception efforts, but there, you know, you see when you start looking at satellite photographs, camouflage and efforts to hide things. Um, and I think the way that the movie was cut um, clearly didn't help uh, make a lot of sense about where the site was, uh, because it's, you know, really short cuts. Um, in a very peculiar order. Um, but my guess is the North Koreans are doing that because of our intelligence community more so than us. Um, I do think, though, that um, they're in a little bit of a bind because it's not a, you know, it's not like they put something on YouTube because they're careless or because they're stupid. Um, they put propaganda on YouTube because propaganda is important to them. And if they have to give up propaganda in order to protect state secrets, that's a trade-off, right? So I think they're always trying to balance um, the information that they make available uh, with the security cost to them. And I think it's the same thing you see with camouflage. Uh, as we transition into things you should know about, um, the Chinese camouflaged all of their um, all of their fixed missile sites, whether they were cave rollout or silos, uh, so that we couldn't see them, um, which was really dumb because stretching a giant camouflage net over a mountain valley just screams frequent revisiting by intelligence, you know, like, and, and you can see now in declassified documents that uh, efforts at camouflage are actually one of the ways that the intelligence community uses to find things. And camouflaging things is inconvenient and difficult. Uh, so, uh, you know, I do worry about deception and I worry about uh, declining influence because of camouflage efforts. Um, but on the other hand, they're sort of stuck. They do have to make information public and they are going to have defectors whether they like it or not. Uh, and so I think it probably remains um, reasonably viable. We had a very interesting conversation. I, I had a couple of friends about whether or not the North Koreans will freak out when they realize that that video revealed the location. Um, and, and my guess is they tend to show things when they're finally constructed so they don't have to show the inside of a plant, right, which is really sensitive to them. And um, I think they probably preferred showing the launcher assembly location to, say, a missile plant or uh, you know something sort of further downstream. Um, and so my guess is they're already making those calculations of, well, we could show a little bit of information for propaganda purposes, but, you know, well, we'll make it really short cuts and you know, really fast. You know, maybe nobody will be able to figure out where it is. Because they've never shown an outside shot of the building, and we will. Uh, third question, things you should know about. Well, you really want me to announce them on camera? <laughs> <laughs> um, Do an act. <laughs> Some countries have tried to build nuclear reactors underground, and I don't think anybody in the intelligence community knows that, um, and that information is now more widely available in the open source, and so we will be revising our estimate of the, um, not of the fissile material production, but of the process of building sites to produce fissile material for certain countries that are very important. That was very vague, but 
We're gonna find a couple of underground reactors that never got finished. Um, for really interesting reasons. But that'll be a different talk. Maybe yeah. maybe in two months. Why do you think they decided to uh, build the world's most abstract skylight instead of just building a giant warehouse building like a Costco? Um, so I think that's not so weird. Uh, they've got an existing, right? They have an existing facility where workers live, where equipment is, and um, they're going to want to do work in the existing facility. One, op one option is to knock the building down and build an entire new building or try to build a building next to it uh, or build the building someplace else and move everybody. The easiest thing to do is to ask, is there anything that's inadequate about the building? And the answer is, cupola is not high enough. You know, knock out one segment and then just build the fan. And they, you know, even did it as a sort of, you know, well, they did it as a fan. And so, I, it, you know, it structurally isn't such a, such a giant problem. So it's, I think, actually the path of least resistance. It's the minimal modification to an existing facility, uh, which is charming because then it indicates the purpose of the facility, right? Because it's the modification that fits most perfectly the purchase. Well, from a state secret point of view, wouldn't it just be better, more advantageous to build a big building? Yeah, if, if, if the only goal that the North Koreans ever had, which is sort of my... Um, where I was trying to go, but maybe didn't quite get there with the answer to Bill's first question. The only goal they had was to preserve state secrecy. They would do things differently, but they have other goals, which is they don't have an infinite amount of money. Um, they don't have an infinite amount of people. They don't have an infinite amount of time. They want to be able to finish the assembly in time for a parade. Right, That's an important goal for them. Right, They showed it at the parade for a reason. And so you get the chassis, and you've got the date, and you've got the people, and you've got so much money, and you decide, well, what is the, what's the straight line from here to there? And I, I think preserving secrecy is a factor, but it's not the only factor. You know? And if preserving secrecy means missiles are not ready for the young general's parade, right? that's worse if you're North Korean. We had one from George, then from Abner. Jeff, can you go back to the to the uh, one that you had? I guess it's the southern site where you had the overlay of the of the sketch. Yeah. When you look at yeah. that, when you look at that facility, have you done an analysis of the roads and the yes. externally? Yes. I mean, it looks very convoluted to get into the building. This is tight. Do you have any idea why there's no rail access or no, you know? No, it just seems that if you're yep. building a building to put transporters in and out of, you would uh, yep. do something different. Uh, yeah, and we spent a lot of time looking at uh, the railhead, and the railhead is not particularly close, which means they probably have to drive them out. Um, and generally speaking, it's a pretty easy drive out. Um, we measured it. You can do it, but it's tight. Um, and so it's a puzzle to me why they didn't just knock down some of these streets. Um, Hard to say. I mean, they clearly paved this, so they clearly were worried about the sort of integrity of the the sort of dirt area next to it. I mean, I think the road is, which the road is still dirt, but I'm guessing it's probably pretty pretty well maintained for a North Korean road. Um, but I I will admit I am a little puzzled by why they didn't just widen this. It's not enough to cause me to lose confidence in the window patterns, though, and the defective testimony. We were, I, I will say, we were very skeptical when we couldn't figure out how they fit the tell in, right? We figured they couldn't parallel park it. So it was only the caster thing that that was, that was a major issue. We'll keep looking. We'd also maybe buy more photographs and see if we can catch them transiting some tells. Have it. Jeffrey, something that you and I have discussed privately, but let's put it in a more general form. Okay. As you know, Israel's entire WMD policy is based on opacity. It means that no factual information whatsoever will be released on all areas, nuclear, delivery, sites, and everything. To what extent do you think that this technology shatters the opacity? Well, I mean, 
first of all, it's not as though the opacity has been perfect. Right? I mean, they let Mr. Venuto take his camera. It was one defector. <laughs> the entire history, one defector, Mr. Venuto. That's what it takes. <laughs> <laughs> but not about the sight of the missiles. Oh, I see. Um, I haven't looked, but I would be very surprised if uh, Israel's efforts to camouflage production and deployment sites for missiles has been successful. Usually it's not. But I, I haven't looked at Israel, so I don't know. I'm just observing that looking at the Saudi case, and I just wrote an article in Foreign Pol Policy about the Saudis. I mean, there's stunning levels of information about the Saudi missile force that are, that's online that I think nobody has paid any attention to. Um, the Chinese, a ton of that information is available, uh, and you can see a lot of the sites. Um, they're camouflaged, so they're a little harder to see, but uh, they're not impossible to see, at least some of them. Um, but Jeffrey, aren't there a Koreans. number of these, at least in terms of U.S. Uh, uh, companies making available imagery, aren't they, uh, aren't there exclusion zones or in terms of the... There are rules okay. about the resolution, mm -hmm. but those rules are usually tied to what's commercially available from foreign providers. And so that number is, you know, the resolution is getting much, 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 much better. Um, and so, you know, the... I mean, I... There's the Kyle Amendment, as you know. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, but it's still, it doesn't prevent the sale of Israeli imagery, it just limits its resolution. resolution. Yeah. But, but we can also buy from other countries now. We yeah, there's no Kyle Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that's the, so that information is, is, is getting out, and, and that then feeds back into what we're able to get from American providers. Um, there is, uh, no one is at the moment exploiting sensors other than, I shouldn't say no one because I say that and in some way will, but very few people are currently looking at sensors other than optical, right? So we just figured out that one of the Chinese gaseous diffusion plants is still operational because it's hot, it's really hot. Um, and you know, nobody's bothered to do that work, but once you do it, there's gonna be a whole range of, you know, and it's not just heat. There's a whole range of stuff, and if, if the camouflage guys, like the Chinese have a, a research institute dedicated to concealment, camouflage, and deception, <clears throat> precisely because the technology is changing so quickly, and if there's not the corresponding investment in a country, um, it's going to be tough. And the other problem is, of course, deterrence, right? You don't, you, you don't want it to be perfectly hermetically sealed, like the North Koreans. you got to show the missile, right? And, and you kind of want to be like, yeah, yeah, no, here's the missile. But as soon as you show the missile, then, you know, Melissa and I are like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, and it, it, and it's, it's a choice. So, I, you know, to answer your big question, does it kill opacity? I don't know. I think it makes opacity uh, a lot more complicated. But then again, it's already complicated because Mr. Venuno took his camera to work. Emily, you call her. Your first thing, Matthew. Okay. Um, so a couple of questions. The first one is just um, continuing on uh, what you were just saying about satellite imagery. Um, you mentioned that you bought some pictures, but mm -hmm. most of these you're showing are from Google Earth. Right. So at the moment, how much of this can you do just with Google, and how much are how much do you need to, to sort of substitute with commercial images? And also then on the mm -hmm. on, you know again on the resolution side, yeah. What um, what are the general resolutions that you'll find on Google versus? Uh, what what you can buy right. somewhere else, and then the the second question was just about the about the work that you're doing um, and the work that other people are doing in this field. And uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the intelligence services. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it seems to me sometimes amazing that intelligence services aren't doing this kind of stuff. They're not looking at heat maps and things like that. It just said no one is. Maybe they well, are. No, no, I, I meant no one in the open source right. community. I'm I'm but pretty really sure that people <laughs> paid to do this do. <laughs> right, okay. I'm only taking pot shots at, no, not even pot shots, I'm suggesting our community on the outside needs to do more of it without prejudging the quality of stuff on the inside. Right, okay. So, um, well, the question on that, though, was more about, yeah. you know, if there's interest, um, uh, uh, even if it's difficult to, um, difficult to decode, if there's interest from governments and from the intelligence, mm -hmm. 
um, uh, uh, services in this kind of work, right. why, if they're already doing this, why, why, okay. do they, why do they even care about what you're doing? Are, are they just sort of trying to be nice to you and, and trying to get to know what you're doing? Or Yeah. Uh, okay, the first question is, uh, you can do a lot with Google Earth because there are a lot of images. That's a little bit misleading, though, because Google Earth uh, has partnerships with places like us, and they ask us, right? Gee, if you could have 12 satellite photographs this quarter, where would you do? And so because of that, the resolution is, or not, I don't get to resolution. I mean, the, the coverage is pretty good on our issues, but that's because they ask us. Um, where we tend to buy satellite photographs is when we're looking for something really specific. Like, I wanted to see those windows. So we had to go through all of the catalogs to find the crap, the poor quality image taken very low in the sky, right. which nobody in the world would want except for the weirdo who wants to look at the windows on the side of the building. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the, when you have a really specific request like, ooh, I want to see this in January 2004, then Google Earth stops being so useful. In terms of resolution, I actually don't know the resolution because all the images on Google Earth are processed. Um, and uh, you know, this is kind of pixely, and so one of the things that we're trying to do is, uh, <laughs> takes money, is get better software to make better use of the existing images. So there's a, a famous picture that shows the um, plume of one of the North Korean rocket launches. And if you've really got the best possible software to look at it, you can see a little smudge on the missile that is probably the DPRK flag. <laughs> you know, now it's a smudge, right? It's only a flag, you know, because you've seen a real picture. But you can extract much better data through better processing, and these are just sort of, uh, you know, it's not that the resolution is lowered, but they, you know, they care about like how quickly Google Earth loads for you. So it's sure. it's kind of a uh, but it's getting quite good, and you know, in some places it's overhead imagery, and then it's startling. Um, the third question is, uh, aren't there professionals who are better at this than we are? Uh, so there are two things. The first is that there is a lot of stuff, right? And, and so even if, even if there is a cadre of people who are really, really good at this and have the best possible images and the best possible tools, uh, there is probably too much stuff for them to look at. Uh, like, I'm pretty sure that the reason that they missed the two reactors that we'll reveal in a couple of months is because they weren't operational and people are busy. And although it ends up being really important historically to understanding what was happening, uh, they had other fish to fry. And so I think, uh, you know, the promise of crowdsourcing is that you can supplement this stuff. There is also an advantage both for presentation of data from the U.S. government, uh, but I think more importantly, uh, for international organizations, uh, you know, the IAEA is now making reasonably extensive use of commercial satellite images. Right? And so that's not an intelligence community. It has to operate on a sort of essentially open source, semi-open source uh, basis, certainly when it comes to the images. Uh, and so by doing this kind of work, Right? We're trying to stand up programs so we can work with international organizations to help them bring their level of capabilities up, um, which would improve uh, monitoring. Now, I don't know why. Well, actually, I do know why. I mean, you could certainly imagine the United States government you know, starting such a program, uh, but it's probably easier for us to do it. Jeff, it touching. Sorry to interrupt yeah. here, but I think that the, the other third uh, or fourth uh, explanation uh, is that uh, in many areas, if you're talking about you know, verifying uh, whatever it may be, uh, it's useful to be able to challenge uh, data that is presented by an intel community. Uh, and this may be more important in some things that we're not talking about uh, at the moment. But it also gives the opportunity for countries mm. that in the past have not really been able to engage, I mean, the, the Russians, the Americans, uh, put forth their explanations. Now you have to worry about you know, other parties who may challenge their, their estimates about what's what's happening, whether it's in the DPRK, Iran, Syria, whatever. Right, right, yeah. So it provides kind of uh, a much uh, more readily accessible means right. uh, to keep other parties honest in terms of what they're presenting. I think that's a really important tool for civil society. You know, I, I know that, um, you know, an, an, an analysis like this would be a 
tremendous value to the UN panel of experts and say the Japanese government um, because uh, you know this is a pretty pretty esoteric thing and so you know if you, if you imagine a you know I, I tend to take a view that it, the US intelligence community is pretty good and pretty honest and so uh, you know, in my view if there is an open source explanation of what is probably happening uh, behind a curtain that people can't see it uh, you know, helps people understand what they're being shown and you know my commitment to civil society I believe that makes better democratic decisions Matthew um, I had a question about kind of the research process here. It was nice to be able to see where you started, the mm -hmm. steps you went through, and where you ended. I'm curious, were there any... I left out all the swearing and the frustration. <laughs> I'm curious, though, in that process, was there any, like, single clue or several clues that if you hadn't found them, like, the project would have just dead-ended and you wouldn't have been able to finish? Um, well, I actually felt like it was a high-wire act, that, like, for a lot of these things, there were points at which... Uh, I was going to be like looking at Bill in a meeting and saying, so you know, we, I know we've been working a long time, we're not going to find it. <laughs> um, we, we didn't sort of, he kind of knew abstractly that we were up to something, but I, uh, I, I, don't, I didn't sort of, it wasn't so clear because I was not convinced we were going to find it. I just, it was such a weird movie and such a weird building uh, that I couldn't help but to like keep looking. Um, I think... If it hadn't been with a really, really gruesome defector account, yeah, I, I, certainly some of the defector. I, I'll tell you what. Without you know, the one that matters most is um, uh, Coe's book, right? And he he has the location wrong. Um, he's got it just up the river, but he got us really, really close. And he made a little cryptic comment about how uh, he could be wrong. And that could just be where they make one piece and the final assembly might be done elsewhere. And that was sort of breadcrummy. So it was like, oh. Because I, like, I felt like he was pretty reliable now, you know, because he was sort of admitting there were things he didn't know, which defectors don't do, right? And defectors will tell you, let's tell you what you want to hear. So I guess maybe without Coe's book. Yes? Uh, just wondering, yeah. what your Chinese friends had to say uh, after you discovered the dual use of uh, friends. Uh, I have Chinese friends. <laughs> <laughs> Just not the sort of people who export, you know, sanctioned goods in North Korea. Actually, the opposite people who catch those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, our friends are like, hey, it's very embarrassing. <laughs> so just wondering what they have to say that now that they've discovered uh, the dual use of the truck, uh, what steps have China taken? Or if they haven't taken any steps or not, um, does does this research have any implications on that? Well, now the the revelation that was the truck happened immediately as soon as people saw it in the parade. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, our research confirms a tiny wrinkle in their story that it was the chassis and the cab that they exported. The cab is still export controlled, like don't like it's. Yeah, it does not get them off the hook at all. Um, but it does add, what, what our analysis adds is a layer of um, nuance to what happened. And, and that ends up mattering, uh, for example, that's not a real sentence, but that matters here. For example, um, there are people who think the number of can weights are constrained by the number of chassis and cabs that the North Koreans imported. Um, but I'm kind of looking around, and I see a couple of buildings, and I see some factories, and I know there's a chassis factory up the river, and it probably doesn't make chassis that are as good as in the Chinese ones. Uh, but I, I see an infrastructure to make tells, and so I don't have nearly the confidence in that judgment that they're stuck at 6K and 08s because that's all the Chinese tells they're ever going to get. You know, I'm more like, eh, you know, they might have six really good ones, and then we'll see six pretty bad ones, and then maybe another six mediocre ones, you know. So that's a, I have a different perspective because I've been staring at the infrastructure. Has there been any feedback from the intelligence community, like NGA or NGIC, about um, like adding, like you, you found, found Hangul from other resources. Has there been any, any interest from 
like add them to their. If their there is, they're not going to tell me that kind of thing. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll see people at meetings, and they'll say, that was really good. And then that's all we can talk about it, you know? And, and that's fine. I don't, I don't desire or expect people to compromise sensitive national security information. I just, I will, I will continue to say, I've never had anybody in the intelligence community tell me that I'm wasting my time and I should give up. And I suppose the day that happens, I'll have to really think about um, what we'll do. But even if they were to say that, you know? I'd probably need to hear it from uh, civil society and other governments that don't have the exquisite capabilities that we almost certainly have. Yes. Uh, so being North Korea, once the revelation is out, so they're probably going to camouflage from the inside rather than the outside. What would be Maybe. your step after that? Well, I mean, right, you say that, but like, that's hard. You know, I mean, you, it is, it, again, and it was my, uh, Jerry's gone, it, but it was my answer to his question. If your only goal is to protect state secrecy, you could do a better job than the North Koreans are doing. But it's not their only goal. So, you know, the dear leaders come in, and you got to sweep the factory, and you got to get the towel finished, and you got to get it in the right spot, you got to make sure he has lunch, and if you have time, maybe you can have somebody who carefully looks around, and, you know, but often it's just, it's impractical. And, uh... You know, I think, to go back to those stills, um, you know, they didn't give away that much, right? I mean, they gave away the dimensions of the building, so maybe they could try to hide that. Um, but, you know, they wanted to show the tells. Um, they avoided, you know, they didn't give you a straight on shot of the, of the skylight, right? We had, we, we had the wrong model at first. Um, the only thing that was unique about it was it was big, but it has to be big, you know? I mean, maybe you could put a, maybe you could tarp up all the windows and tarp up the skylight and, you know, but then, you know, you gotta light the, gotta light Kim Jong-il as he's looking at the towel. I mean, it's, you, you have, there are a lot of choices and trade-offs to make and I think, um, you can always do better with camouflage and concealment in hindsight. Um, I think it's very hard to know in advance, particularly when there's, uh, and this is the point, multiple streams of information that can be put together. Uh, I see your hand, and I will call on you, I promise, or I will insist that Brian call on you at the appropriate time. <laughs> uh, but, you know, sometimes you'll hear people will, like, you know, if you ever FOIA a U.S. intelligence document, if it gets declassified twice, you can put them together, you know, because human beings don't always make the same choices uh, and collating lots of streams of information usually is a good way to defeat uh, camouflage. Who was that? I missed the first one. Oh. Uh, regarding your future research for underground facilities, what tactics do you um, plan on using instead of looking at the facility? Obviously, you can tell by the way the infrastructure is. If it's underground, you have to look to other sources of being able to tell where these things well, are. Well, <laughs> you still have to get into an underground facility. I mean, my favorite example of the, one of the big problems uh, with hiding underground facilities is you have to get there, which means there is a road. And usually you're talking about heavy equipment, which means it's the nicest road in the entire, you know, nicest road in the county, probably the nicest road in the province, and it dead ends in a mountain. <laughs> I, I mean, so there are these there are these distinct signatures. Um, we have lots of cases where, especially North Koreans, still show video from underground facilities um, because, again, right there's a propaganda value to them that they feel they need to uh, achieve. And uh, now we're playing with. Um, Sure, multispectral, hyperspectral. I mean, there are a lot of new sensors coming online um, that will allow you to see where they're dumping heat out of a facility, you know, or if they're cooling it. Uh, well, it's not it, you know, you, you'll be able to see those kinds of features, and those are hard to camouflage. Um, you know, like if you put a tarp over your exhaust fan that's blowing out the heat, you will regret. It. So the Chinese, you can guess the status of their commercial. You can guess the relative size of their commercial centrifuge plants by the number of mechanical drop fans.
because they buy them commercially and they have a certain capacity and then stack them up in a row and you just count them. Um, so there are all those kinds of, uh, of, of issues. Um, and then, and I, you know, I don't be careful about how I, how I express this. It's not such an issue in North Korea, but it, it matters elsewhere. Um, there is a lot of stuff in social media. People have big mouths. There is a missile base associated with a foreign missile program that has never been mentioned in the state media of a particular country. But you can find out anything about that base if you just go to the appropriate foreign language bulletin board where the people who get posted there and are annoyed because it's in the middle of nowhere and it's secret and their housing is lousy, complain. They tell you how long your commute is. They tell you about the weather. They can name the nearest local town. I mean, it's ridiculous. There's actually a Chinese facility that's very similar where um, it's great. Some guy went picnicking with his girlfriend. And the uh, security forces like picked them up and told them, like, no, no, you need to go across the street. And he was trying to figure out like what he had done wrong, so he didn't do it again. And somebody's like, oh, we have an ICBM base. <laughs> the other side of the road, because that side is right here. <laughs> if you come back, I'll show you where to go picnic. <laughs> uh, so that you don't compromise any sensitive national security sites. <laughs> My email address is. I mean, it just. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, like, come on. You guys see people get fired from their jobs all the time for putting things inappropriate, right? Facebook, Twitter. You guys wonder why I would get fired for putting things in our <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, uh, foreign employees of localities and missile programs and nuclear programs do exactly the same thing every day. You just have to look. Uh, while you're looking at the, I mean, the infrastructure at Hanwu, did you find any buildings that might hint at Musudan or Hwasong ICBM development? Or would you yeah. think it would be at like a different city entirely? Uh, so, if we were to continue doing this research, we're out of money, so we're gonna, we're gonna do some other stuff for a while. <laughs> um, but you could go down this rabbit hole forever. Um, I would want to nail down the date of the fan, because it may be that, I mean, the fan will accommodate a Musudan too. So you may be able to determine uh, you know, it may turn out that they plan to buy a can of weight looking thing long before they started talking to the Chinese about it, right? Um, so there are those kinds of possibilities. But you could do uh, you could do a Musudan in here. Um, and it could be the other building too. So it's you know, it's one of those things that with more satellite photographs, more time, <laughs> more Melissa's, more Amber's, uh, me sleeping less, we could probably do, but we just have to go down. Yes? Uh, this is a good question. Uh, could you let me know how much was the vehicle when China's export, exported that vehicle to China? 30 million renminbi for six. They pay uh, 18 up front for the first, oh gosh, was it two and then four? Yeah. So it was 18 for the first two, and then another 12 for the next four. Which you know, standard pricing, right? The first two are more expensive, then you get a discount. <laughs> it's a commercial good. Do you expect the greedy people who run Wan Shan special vehicle to be any different than the greedy people who run, you know, General Motors? It's exactly the same pricing plan. Those thirty million run in B. The Chinese announced it, right? The first export of a Wan Shan special vehicle chassis and cab to a foreign customer. They just didn't mention the foreign customer. Actually, you know, like I'm working. I do. And I see some trading statistics, but it seems like it's not only the one case. China. It seems like I cannot make a definite judgment, but it seems like China had exported that vehicle from 2004 to 2004. No, they did it in two shipments. In oh, Melissa, remind me. One was in like May, and the other was in August of 2011 or 10. 11. Oh, Catherine, you it was two shipments. Uh, you know, we know the ships, we know the days. I just don't remember the days. The well, national trading statistics they show that there's a special vehicle was exported. They they, oh. they did export other uh, 
smaller trucks. But these these really big ones. Yeah. Well, we have the dates of the shipment and the dates of the payment. So you could go dig it. If only you were a graduate student and needed to write a thesis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right, why don't you join me in giving a hand to our speaker?